Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to have you here with us. Before I begin, I want to introduce the wonderful people on the stage with me. Obviously, she needs no introduction, the First Lady, Michelle Obama. <laughs> and then standing to her right, um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Um, we also have the, from the Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, John Leibowitz the Director of the Office of Health Reform from the White House, Nancy Ann DeParle. And then to my left, we have the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan, and the Assistant Secretary from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Kathleen Merrigan. So I'm really pleased to have them here with us today. Ninety days ago, as many of you know, the President gave us a charge. He first formed the first ever task force on childhood obesity, and he asked us to all work together to ensure that we could reduce the levels of childhood obesity and reduce it significantly within a generation. But in doing that, he also told us two things that were critical to our work. First of all, he told us that the federal government can't do this alone, that we had to work together with the private sector, with the philanthropic sector, with parents, with community advocates, with absolutely everyone who has a stake in ensuring that children are leading healthy and balanced lives. So we set out to work together with them. The next thing he told us is that we also had to work to ensure that we were bringing together people um, in the public and that we were working together with the public to ensure that we know what they think. And we did that, and we were just bowled over by the response that we received. Over 200 and 200, I'm sorry, over 2,500 responses from doctors and nurses, parents, community advocates, and others telling us and giving us and sharing us with us their recommendations and their best thoughts on this issue. So we believe that with those two things combined that we have produced a really informed report and we're very, very proud today and I want to share it with you that we are rolling out this report responding to the President's charge. In this report, we have what we believe is a roadmap, um, an action-enforcing set of recommendations, over 70 recommendations, that will help us move from today forward to ensure that we can, in, in fact, reduce the levels of childhood obesity in a generation. What we know we have to do and what we believe we can do is to move from the levels where we are today, about 20 percent of our young people who are obese, down to about 5% of our people, young people who are obese, by the year 2030. So in the next 20 years, we're going to be working together with the private sector, with state and local governments, um, and with others to, based on these recommendations to try and achieve that goal. And we do believe that that goal is achievable. To do that, we're going to be working in five different areas. First of all, making sure that children get a healthy start to their lives. That means that we have recommendations on prenatal care for uh, future mothers and their, their children. We also are including breastfeeding opportunities for young mothers and their infants. We are talking about limits on screen time so children are able to live a more healthy and active life and making sure that children who are in our childcare facilities are also getting ample physical activity. Second, we want to empower parents and caregivers. We, as I said, believe that this isn't something that the federal government can do alone. We aren't moving into people's homes. What we're doing is we're sharing information with parents and caregivers so that they have actionable messages clear messages about what they should be doing, what will be helpful to them to make sure that their children, the children under their care, are leading healthier lives and that we're moving closer to our goal. Those things include reduced marketing of unhealthy products to children and also improved health care services, including BMI measurement for children. Third, we're providing and suggesting and making recommendations around providing healthy foods in schools. Through investments in federally supported school lunches and breakfasts, upgrading the other kinds of foods that are available at our schools, the a la carte foods that are available at our schools, and also improving nutrition education. Fourth, improving access to healthy, affordable food by eliminating food deserts. And we've heard um, the First Lady and those who are sharing the stage with me today talk very, very passionately about this issue. We've gone around the country and looked at the good work that's happening in communities in the country 
both in communities, both urban and rural, where this problem exists, and making recommendations so that we can address it. Also, lowering the relative prices um, so that we can make sure that healthier foods are getting into our communities and to our children. And finally, making sure that children are leading physically active lives. That includes everything from recess at school to making sure that children are able to access physical activity in the built environment, that they're able to bike to school, that they're able to walk to school, and that they're able to do so safely. So those are the kind of recommendations that are embedded in this report. We're very, very proud of it. And at this moment, I'm also proud to introduce to you a person who has been working on this issue from day one and has given so much in terms of her savvy and in terms of her knowledge to this issue, the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Melody, for that kind introduction, that wonderful summary. Uh, I want to thank Melody in particular for her work with this administration, uh, especially her leadership on this task force. Uh, as I said when we announced the task force effort, this is going to have to be an administration-wide effort. Uh, and I'm proud of the way that so many people from so many different uh, uh, areas of the federal government have come together and embraced this challenge, stepped up with a level of commitment and passion uh, that's really made a difference. Um, if we just take a step back for a moment and think about just how much uh, this group has been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. Uh, in just a few months, the folks behind me have uh, worked together to put forward a comprehensive plan that draws on everything that we've done up to this point and shows us that clear way forward. Uh, that cooperation, enthusiasm, and initiative uh, is really what has made this entire effort so successful. Uh, and again, that's why we're here today, uh, to talk about the action plan that they've put together to help reverse the uh, epidemic of childhood obesity in, in this country. Uh, we all know that it's possible. Uh, we, we know we have the tools. We know we have the resources to make this happen. And now, uh, thanks to the work of the task force, uh, we have a roadmap for implementing our plan across our government and across the country. Uh, I have talked about the statistics. We have all heard about them, but they always bear repeating. Uh, how nearly one in three children in this country are overweight and obese, uh, how one in three kids will suffer from diabetes at some point in their lifetime as a result, uh, and how we're spending $150 billion a year to treat obesity-related conditions like heart disease and cancer. Uh, that is why three months ago we started Let's Move, uh, and we set a very ambitious goal and that is to end the epidemic of childhood obesity in a generation so that children born today grow up at a healthy weight. And since we've made that announcement, we've already begun the work. Uh, it's revolved around four main pillars. Uh, we've been working to give parents the information that they need to make healthy decisions for their families. Uh, we've been working to make our schools healthier. Uh, we've been working to increase the amount of physical activity that our kids are getting, not just during the day at school, but also at home. Uh, and we're working to eliminate food deserts so that folks uh, have easy and affordable access to the foods that they need right in their own neighborhoods. But all that we've done over the past few months has really just been the beginning. We also want to make sure that we're using every resource that we have not just in our federal government, but throughout the public and private sector as well. Uh, we are calling upon mayors and governors and parents and educators, business owners and health care providers, anyone who has a stake in giving our children the healthy, happy future that we all know they deserve. And as I've said before, uh, we don't need new discoveries or new inventions to reverse this trend. Uh, again, we have the tools at our disposal to reverse it. All we need is the motivation, the opportunity, and the willpower to do what needs to be done. That's why shortly after we started Let's Move, we asked the task force to collect ideas and to put together a roadmap for what we need to do moving forward. But we've also known, uh, as Melody pointed out from the very beginning, that the solution to this epidemic isn't going to come from just Washington alone. Uh, 
Not a single expert that we've consulted has said that having the federal government tell people what to do is the way to solve this. Um, that's why the task force has done such a great job in reaching out to people all across the country for their ideas, as Melody has pointed out. And we've got terrific responses and input, which has really helped to shape uh, this report. Today, the task force has submitted their report outlining important steps that federal agencies and their partners, including businesses and the private sector, will take in the months and years ahead to help keep our children healthy. Uh, for the first time, this is the key, we're setting really clear goals and benchmarks and measurable outcomes that will help tackle this challenge one step, one family, and one child at a time. The effort starts with using the resources across the federal government in the most effective ways possible. Not just talking about making a difference, but actually doing it. And that's why I am so proud of the folks behind me, because they've really taken the lead and stepped up in their agencies. At the Department of Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack, who couldn't be here today, but Kathleen is, is leading the way to first reauthorize the Child Nutrition Act. Uh, to get healthier foods in our schools and to make sure that everyone in this country has access to healthy, affordable foods in their neighborhoods. Uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sebelius is working to provide mothers with better prenatal care and to give parents and caregivers the information they need to make healthy decisions for their families. Uh, at the Department of Education, Secretary Duncan is working to expand opportunities for physical activity in schools and helping our children learn how to make healthy choices for themselves. And at the White House, Nancy Ann DeParle worked with Secretary Sebelius and so many others to help pass health reform, the bill that is groundbreaking piece of legislation that includes really important provisions like requiring chain restaurants to post the calories in their food and businesses to provide opportunities for working mothers to continue to breastfeed. This report also contains these steps, but, but many others, uh, more than 70, as Melody pointed out, including measurable benchmarks for tracking uh, the progress. So if we do our jobs and if we meet the goals we've set, we will reverse a 30-year trend and solve the problem of childhood obesity in America. Uh, in order to make our kids maintain a healthy weight uh, from the very beginning, we're going to increase prenatal counseling, help pregnant mothers maintain a healthy weight. Uh, we're also setting a goal to increase breastfeeding rates to help children get a healthy start in life. Uh, to encourage children to eat healthier, we're setting a goal to increase the amount of fruits that children consume to 75% of the recommended level by 2015, we want to increase that again by, to 85% by the year 2020, and then by the year 2030, we hope to be at 100%. We're using a similar scale to increase the percentage of vegetables that our kids are eating as well. Uh, we're also working to decrease the amount of added sugar that our kids consume from a whole range of products. Uh, and to make sure that parents and kids are getting the right information that they need to make healthy decisions, uh, we're setting a goal that all primary care physicians should be assessing BMI at all well child and adolescent visits by the year 2012. And we're also working to increase the portion of healthy food and beverages that are advertised and targeted to our children so that within three years, the majority of food and beverage ads aimed at kids will promote healthy choices. Uh, we're also setting benchmarks for our schools as well. Uh, we'll be working, uh, as I've said many times over the months, to double the number of schools that meet the healthier U.S. school uh, challenge by the year 2011. And we want to add another uh, 1,000 schools each year for the following two years. Uh, we're also aiming to add uh, an additional 2 million children to the National School Lunch Program by 2015. And to help our kids stay active, uh, we're going to increase the number of high school students who participate in daily PE classes by 50 percent by the year 2030. Um, and we'll aim to increase the percentage of elementary schools that offer recess uh, to 95% by the year 2015. 
Uh, both these steps are aimed at boosting the number of kids of all ages who meet current physical activity guidelines. And to make it easier for parents to put healthy food on the table, we're going to keep track of the low-income areas where residents live more than a mile from a supermarket or large grocery store. And for rural areas, we're tracking those that are more than 10 miles away. Uh, and we'll set a goal of eliminating all those food deserts uh, within seven years. And to make it easier for kids to walk to school, we're aiming to increase the percentage of school-age children who take safe walking and biking trips to school by 50% in the next five years. In the end, uh, that's why this report and this task force are so important. Uh, we all know the dangers of childhood obesity and the toll that it takes on our children, our families, and our country. Uh, we know the steps that we need to take to reverse the trend. Uh, through Let's Move, we've already started making some progress. We've gotten wonderful support uh, uh, from all sectors of our country. And now with this report, uh, we have a very solid roadmap uh, that we need to make these goals real uh, to solve this problem within a generation. Uh, now we just need to follow through uh, with the plan. Uh, we just need everyone to do their part, and it's going to take everyone. N no one gets off the hook on this one, uh, from governments to schools, corporations to nonprofits, all the way down to families sitting around their dinner table. Uh, and the one thing that I can promise is that at fir as First Lady, I'm going to continue uh, to do everything that I can to focus my energy to keep this issue at the forefront of the discussion in this society um, so that we ensure that our children uh, can have the healthy lives and the bright futures that they deserve. Uh, so I am grateful to everyone here, um, not just members on stage, but people in the media who have really done an outstanding job to continue to keep this issue at the forefront. Uh, we're going to keep needing to have this conversation. Uh, our work has just begun. Uh, this roadmap uh, is just the beginning. Uh, but we're going to continue to need, need your help in monitoring, tracking, uh, having uh, the important discussions that we need to inform families about what's going on, uh, how to make the changes that they need. It's not going to be easy, uh, but we'll do our part to stick with families and communities uh, and uh, reach our goals. Uh, so I want to thank you all for the support you've lended this effort. I'm very proud um, of our federal agencies, all our secretaries and our agency heads. Uh, every single one of them has shown a passion. Uh, they've seen around the country that we're poised to make a difference uh, in, in this country, that people are ready for this change. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll again thank Melody for her work in leading this uh, very efficient and effective effort. Um, and then we'll open it up. Uh, these secretaries will answer questions. I will leave. Uh, <laughs> but they're very competent to get that done. So thank you all. Thank you, Doug. Well, we would like to open this up and take your questions, and we let us know if you want them directed to any particular person, but great, we've got a lot of hands. Why don't we start here? If you give us your name and your organization, that would be terrific. Thank you. Uh, Toby Zakaria with Reuters. Uh, there's a mention in uh, the recommendations about a higher tax on sugary drinks. I, was, I wanted to get more information on that and how you would propose to implement such a thing and whether you think you could actually get something like that through Congress. Sure. I don't know if there's someone. I'm happy to answer. Go ahead. I think the reference to the tax is um, a reference to what is going on in some states and localities around the country. There is no proposal for a federal uh, tax on sugar, uh, but it is a strategy that is in place in some communities and that others are taking a strong look at because it, it does correlate to a, a lower use. So I think the reference is more that this is one of the 
efforts underway right now in communities, and it may be a, a strategy that others want to deploy, but there's no recommendation for a federal tax. Next question. Uh, Jerry Hagstrom from National Journals Congress Daily. Uh, I'd like to address this question to Deputy Secretary Merrigan. Uh, I noticed that one of the recommendations, or ac no, actually the actions that you have planned, is to update the uh, dietary guidelines and the food uh, pyramid. And the question I have is whether that is on a speeded up schedule compared with the way that they are, I think they're normally done every few years. Uh, I'm just wondering how soon you'll be doing that. The, um, thanks, Jerry, for that question. The process has been underway now for uh, nearly a year. We had a committee of experts um, working on that, and uh, we are uh, very close to uh, a first release for people to um, get into the weeds and figure out how they feel about it. So it's, it's, it's been ongoing for a while, and it's married up to the larger effort. Great. Next question. Yes, here. I'd like to know about the f school lunch program um, mm -hmm. with the a uh, particularly the a la carte items served in school. Will, will there be any outright ban on some of the more nutritionally questionable foods served? How deep will the reg regulation go? Okay. We'll be working with Secretary Vilsack to, to think that thing through, but what, what he's pushing so hard on is to make sure that the foods we're serving, the breakfasts and lunches, are healthier, making sure what's in vending machines is healthy, and uh, making sure that we're helping to instill in students at an early age um, an understanding of these issues. And so he, he's not here, obviously, today to talk through the details of it, but he's trying to take the country, I think, in an extraordinarily important direction and is looking for increased funding for the Child Nutrition Act, but to put that money not into the status quo, but into mo much more nutritious meals, doing better stuff in the vending machines as well. And uh, he's been just a phenomenal partner in this effort. I think one thing I would also add to that. Oh, Kathleen, do you want to go? Well, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, we are looking at the quality of school meals, but we're also looking at uh, a population in this country where nearly 18% of children are food insecure. And so one of the pillars of Let's Move in this report you'll read is about food access. And food access is about food deserts, but it's, it's about hunger and obesity. Same <coughs> root cause, lack of access to good healthy food. And we know that we have 32 million children now that are in the school lunch program, but we only have 11 million in the school breakfast program. And, and worst of all, in the summertime, we have about 2.4 million in our summer feeding programs. So we also have access issues about uh, getting children access to meals. In some cases, we know that children, uh, really their only sustenance, their real sustenance during the day is coming from these, these, these national school lunch program and, and breakfast, and we need to do better. So that's also part of the priority of the child nutrition reauthorization that we're all engaged in this year quality and as well reach. I also think this is an excellent example of the kind of partnership we were talking about. This is an area where not only do we agree across the administration, but the food and beverage industry is also in agreement with us that a la carte foods as well as the lunches and breakfasts that we've been talking about meet certain nutritional standards. So that's an example of the kind of collaboration. Um, yes, sure. Why don't we wait for the microphone? Hi, I'm Lynn Sweet from the Chicago Sun-Times and Politics Daily. One of the proposals has to do with having insurance policies, so I'm looking, I guess, at Nancy Parley and Secretary Sebelius, cover childhood obesity programs. Is that something that is not common now? And why make a distinction between adult obesity and insurance coverage and childhood obesity? Yeah. Well, uh, I believe what the report's talking about is covering, among other things, prevention right. and making sure that children get wellness visits and get the, you know, the care that they need. And we do know that that will help families to lower their costs and lower insurance premiums. So I think that's the reason why it's focused on that. But would that include, let's say, surgery? Uh, would that include whatever across the board recommendation there might be? I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. But why make a distinction in wellness between adult obesity and childhood obesity? Because I believe you did, you're not uh, adult well, no, prevention program. will be covered for adults as well. And 
Lynn, I think some yeah. of the some of the issues about what specifically are going to be covered in prevention packages have not yet been determined. But I think there's no question that uh, a lot of people believe that if you intervene at a much earlier stage, uh, the likelihood that um, you could change a child's patterns and not end up with uh, the kind of adult pattern where two out of three adults right now are overweight or obese is is also a strategy worth uh, having. But prevention efforts are going to be available across the board and, and certainly aimed at obesity uh, across the board. This report is focused on childhood obesity. Rodale. Thank you. <laughs> this is for the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. Over and over again, the Federal Trade Commission has had uh, opportunities to reduce somehow or other the amount of advertising to children mm -hmm. on television. And every time you've tried, uh, you flunked. What's going to make it different now? Well, I think we've been working on this. Well, you're right. I mean, if you go back to the 1970s and the late 1970s and the early 1980s, there was a, an effort to sort of regulate uh, food marketing to kids. Um, I think one thing that makes a difference now is, first of all, this is a really multifaceted approach, you know, involving a lot of different agencies, a lot of different uh, 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 things that will help reduce um, obesity, particularly childhood obesity. For our agency, um, I think we are working uh, fairly cooperatively with uh, food marketing companies, and that's a good thing. Um, as you may know, in 2005, we subpoenaed uh, 44 major food marketing companies, and fast food companies, and we asked them to make commitments to market only healthier foods to kids. Um, and uh, although they haven't done quite as much as we might like, um, or as fast as we like. We did get some commendable progress. Um, now we're going back into the field, and we're going to see, you know, we're going to go back and send subpoenas back to all of these companies, which we can do to look at an industry, um, and we'll find out whether they're honoring their commitments and whether we can make them do more. Sorry, but we already know that they are not honoring their commitments enough to have made any difference. Well, I don't want to prejudge, but, but, you know, we have seen, to some extent, uh, marketing of healthier foods to kids. But I agree with you, more needs to be done. But I also think that uh, a regulatory approach is, is certainly not where we want to start. So. Well, I think you try to start by pushing self-regulation, by using your bully pulpit, uh, which the First Lady is doing and we're trying to do in our own small way. Uh, and. Um, uh, by commending the companies that are really stepping up to the plate and, you know, sometimes shaming companies that aren't doing enough. Uh, but, you know, we're in danger of becoming a, uh, a nation, as we all know, a nation of, uh, of corpulent Americans. Nobody wants to see that. And uh, we're going to work really, really hard. I think regulation is the last thing you want to do. And there are also important First Amendment concerns. If we tried to regulate what foods could be marketed, um, I think that would be uh, that would be a matter that would be in litigation for quite some time. We don't have the authority to do that, by the way, because Congress in the 1970s, as a result of the efforts, uh, then uh, took away our authority to uh, engage in uh, food marketing regulations, so uh, certain types of food marketing regulations. Um, so um, we're going to keep on working on it, and we like this approach that's sort of collective and uh, multifaceted. Thanks, John. I'm sorry. Out of this task force, I mean, to implement any of this? Well, no, I mean, I think, first of all, the First Lady referenced the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Bill um, that uh, Congress has already started to move on. We've seen um, Chairman Lincoln take really wonderful steps uh, to that end. It was something that was included in our budget that the President sent up this year. We continue to work with the Chairwoman and other members of Congress to increase the amount of funding to support that program. We also have the Healthy Food Financing Initiative that was in our budget um, that we want to move forward. So again, this is there are array of different recommendations and proposals that are included in the report, again, including what we can do at the federal level, but also what state and local governments can do, what the private sector can do. In some cases, we're encouraging you know, one sector to act. In some cases, it will require all sectors to act. But there, it includes uh, legislation. It includes recommendations for what should happen in the private sector. Going forward, the First Lady and the task force will 
take the lead on efforts with regard to the private sector. We obviously will be moving forward on the things that will be done on the federal level and working with state and local governments as well. Yes. I have a couple of questions, uh, school-related questions for Secretary Duncan, please. Okay. And if you could give us your name and organization, sure. please. Sure. Uh, Peter Mayer with CBS News. Secretary Duncan, uh, this recommendation to um, increase uh, the, the walking and uh, safe walking distance to schools by 50 percent that Mrs. Obama mentioned, uh, how do you think you can do that uh, to, with local school systems uh, having their own mandates and so forth? Do you envision uh, decreasing, say, school bus service to kids that live a certain distance from, you know, yeah, close to so schools? Obviously, those are local decisions. Those aren't decisions. We don't make school busing decisions here in Washington. But I think it's really shining a spotlight on how beneficial this is. It's really um, uh, helping districts do the right thing. Um, so it's not, again, it's not a federal mandate. It's not getting into uh, transportation routes. But it's really uh, encouraging people to, to do this. And we have, we have resources. <coughs> and we have $410 million we want to invest in a program called Safe and Healthy Students and thinking about, you know, what we're doing before school, to and from school, during school, recess. Uh, lunch. We want to um, put, our, put our money where our mouth is. And I'm just convinced, and the First Lady's been granted this, that you know, children aren't going to be at their best academically if they're not healthy. And so this is really a way to make sure students have the maximum chance of fulfilling their, their academic potential. And as we approach the, what in many areas is the end of the school year, uh, the question for you or anyone else uh, up there, um, to what extent are you concerned that the uh, effort to have good nutrition for so many kids who can only rely on school lunches and school breakfasts for their daily nutrition is going to just uh, collapse every year at this time. No, that's a, that's a real concern, and, and we can talk it through, but I think the summer feeding program is a big, big deal, and maybe going to walk through what the plans are for the summer. But yeah, that's, that's something I worry about a lot of students, whether it's you know, over the summer or even over the weekends, who are really struggling to get food and quality food at home. That's a big challenge. You want to walk through the summer feeding program? Well, it, it Nothing to walk through exactly. I mean, again, it's 2.4 million children. If you assume that at least the 11 million children that now participate in school breakfast programs are of an income level that they really need that assistance, and we know we have 2.4 million children getting the summer feeding programs, that's a significant gap. We also know that only 88,000 of the 100,000 schools that have a school lunch program in place offer the breakfast program. So 11 million is probably not the whole of it. And so we do have a significant gap. And again, this is a, a very important issue that we're discussing in the context of the child nutrition reauthorization a legislation effort. Uh, to underscore what Melody said, the, um, the President's FY11 budget proposal that went up to Capitol Hill put forth a billion dollars a year uh, to support the child nutrition reauthorization. That's what we feel we need. Uh, Congress is struggling to find those dollars, but I think we all agree it's an extremely important effort, and we're hoping that uh, we can go beyond what the Senate bill has done. It's a great start. It's a $4.5 billion effort, but we believe we need a, a $10 billion bill. Um, you asked a little bit about kids walking to school, uh, obviously the schools uh, are a piece of it, but the surrounding neighborhoods, if they're not designed in a way that allows for in many communities without even sidewalks, much less bike paths or other ways for kids to get to school. So there's a range of ways in the recommendations that HUD, also working with the Department of Transportation and the Department of Justice, will be working to ensure that we have opportunities for kids to walk to school, whether that's when we're redeveloping a community through, say, a Hope 6, a public housing community, making sure that we have sidewalks that are incorporated. Uh, often, if you look at the current, the older designs of public housing, you, you don't have what we call eyes on the street. And so we've been incorporated front porches and a range of features uh, to those developments that make them safer uh, and coordinated with local police departments to ensure that there are pathways to school that are there. Then more broadly, whether it's for the transportation funding, our community development block grant funding, uh, or other sources, we've developed a set of livability principles. Uh, we funded $100 million in regional planning grants in our last budget that are helping communities develop standards, best practices for, and actually funding the planning work to incorporate sidewalks, bike paths, and a range of other uh, features that will make it possible for kids who are interested in walking to school to be able to do that. Right on the front row. Your microphone. Oh, sorry about that. 
Thank you. Uh, Steve Koff, Cleveland Plain Dealer. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the concept of food deserts and the healthy food financing initiative. Presumably, you've talked with supermarket CEOs and executives. I'd like to know what they tell you is the reason that they do not locate in uh, neighborhoods with a lot of population density, but that do have the food deserts. Do you believe them? And why is it the federal government's responsibility to basically help them finance supermarkets when the population is there? Um, we had a, a lot of experience with this uh, in New York City when I was housing commissioner there developing a set of standards. Uh, what you often see is a, a lack of information about the purchasing uh, potential in those communities. So I think there are things that we can do uh, getting more information out to companies about the purchasing potential. But I think the single uh, biggest barrier that, that we've seen uh, particularly in public housing communities or other uh, types, uh, very, very difficult uh, to get retail in there, particularly with the right size floor, pla floor plates uh, for, uh, for su supermarkets in many communities. So one of the things that we'll be working on uh, as we redevelop, uh, say, public housing through our Choice Neighborhoods uh, initiative is making sure that there is uh, available space uh, of the right uh, size and dimensions for a, a modern supermarket uh, to be available. The other thing I would mention is a lot of this is also access to fresh food as well in food deserts. It's not just places for supermarkets, but it's the opportunity for growing fresh food. Uh, we A lot of investments we're making, particularly in communities that have been hard hit by foreclosures uh, and abandonment. Uh, there's an opportunity for urban farming, uh, and we've been doing that in a number of cities around the country through investments we've made in the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. I think uh, another opportunity is the connections uh, we've been working with the Department of Agriculture to do food systems planning that allows uh, connections to be made with those neighborhoods to surrounding farmers within the metropolitan area to set up whether uh, its uh, farm markets uh, in those communities, and even to, to grow foods uh, within a public housing development. There's nothing like the experience of a young child uh, growing vegetables and understanding the connection uh, between healthy foods and seeing it before their very eyes. And so uh, we've, we've worked a lot, just like the White House Garden does that, uh, in public housing in other communities to make sure that we have land available for those kinds of gardens. The other piece of this, and I think it's one of the reasons that it's so important to have this multi-agency look, often a big, a, a big purchaser in any area can be the school lunch and breakfast program. So changing the school guidelines, driving the opportunity to purchase more local fruits and vegetables then creates a demand that may or may not be on the radar screen right now for grocers, but quickly comes on the radar screen. So. Um, you know, as a former governor, we saw this in communities. Uh, it, it's ironic in a very rural breadbasket state that we had food deserts, but there were areas where it was tough to get a grocery store to come in with a full range of produce until you actually engaged one of the local institutions to be a major purchaser, and then that stream of revenue was pretty apparent. So having the Department of Agriculture keyed in with the housing, with others, I think can create some financing incentives that may or may not be readily apparent right now. Just one last little thing, I'm gonna throw something out. Um, the First Lady uh, said it's rural and urban food deserts affects all of the areas of the country. And, um, and you look at the FY11 budget proposal, it doesn't seem to be the largest pot of money you've ever seen, but we are thinking very creatively when it comes to food deserts. So for example, a lot of rural communities that um, need help, they don't have the population density to support a brick and mortar grocery store operation as many of us may conjure up in our mind. And so we were looking at things like developing mobile supermarkets where a mobile grocery comes to your community and it's there on Wednesday afternoons from 4 to 8 along with the bookmobile and the community health facility that comes in. So uh, there are a variety of strategies that we are all working on in concert to, to address this issue. Right. Uh, just to, I think, underscore what Kathleen was just saying, so this isn't the federal government coming in and saying we're putting a grocery store here. 
This is the federal government trying to leverage, also leverage private dollars um, to serve as an incentive to come up with really ingenious and creative ideas to bring fresh foods and access to fresh foods and vegetables to communities that don't have them. And we've seen this work very, very successfully. Uh, one, of, one of the most successful communities that some of us have visited was in Philadelphia. So that's, I think, a shining example of one place where this can happen quite well. Um, why don't we, um, I'm sorry, what, I'm, who said follow up? Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jane Black. Jane Black from the Washington Post. I just have a question about the access, because there's a lot of talk about access, but not quite as much talk about affordability of fruits and vegetables. I mean, there's this idea that if you just put a supermarket or put the vegetables in the corner store that people will buy them. Um, and one of the big battles is kind of trying to make the cost of the healthy food as affordable as the junk food, if you will. And um, you know that's gonna be played out in the farm bill and in subsidies and there's been less luck than some people um, would like sort of taking subsidies away from some people. So my question is, does, is there anything in this proposal or on the horizon about you working to make these products more affordable when it comes to the farm bill or elsewhere um, so that people can buy them once they have access so that people can afford them? Sure. Well, I'm going to share, Jane, some of my personal shopping experiences, as relevant as they are. I actually think that fruits and vegetables are not as expensive as people believe they are, and that I know for many of us, a lot of the money is spent in those internal aisles in the grocery store where a lot of your processed foods are, are, are sitting and your kids are tagging on your arm sleeve asking you to buy. Uh, I think that it's a more complicated effort that requires education. It's a whole of government approach in because it's about time and convenience and access. Uh, and it's really a community-wide support. One of the great examples that we've all uh, paid attention to as we've been developing this is the Shape Up Somerville initiative in Massachusetts, where I'm from. Can't be government doing it alone. It's not going to be a local community doing it alone. It's got to be foundations and the schools and the school PTAs. And we're really, it's, it's complicated. But getting people to eat more fruits and vegetables, and this I will leave to Secretary Sebelius to discuss, but it's, it's a complicated thing. And it's not a price-driven alone uh, challenge that we, that we must meet. So no, <laughs> so no to, to in this part of this being increased subsidies for fruits and vegetables because of course it is part of the problem. I understand it's a multi, it, it, it's a complicated issue, but certainly price is one issue and that's one thing that's not addressed. Well, and certainly, you know, price and we started out and we were talking, the person raised a question about um, the soda tax or sugar tax and that's an issue that if you look at this report, we acknowledge what's going on both with regard to subsidies and with regard to taxes and what states and localities are doing, that this is an issue that we have to take on and do further study. Um, and we encourage and recommend that further study be, doing there, be done there because we've received some information, but in all cases it's not conclusive. So we draw from what we know and we recommend that there be further study so that we can determine what will be appropriate next steps. And um, I'm getting the sign. I was going to take a question here, so this will be the last question. Um, Chris Anderson with Cable Access. I, I just wanted to ask whether how, we, how you plan to tap into the kids and draw them into these programs, into the food nutrition programs and the uh, activity programs. Will that happen through the school system? And then as you have um, children who grow up, presumably as they're more nutritionally savvy as they grow up to be healthier adults. Um, are we looking at potential savings in terms of uh, the bigger picture down the line? Is that part of what the thinking is also? Sure. Well, I think taking your question in reverse, I mean, we know that we spend about $150 billion annually on diseases related to obesity. Um, so diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. So it's critical, and I think one of my colleagues said this at the top of um, this event, that we take this issue on now so that we aren't addressing these issues in the future. It's, not, it's critical, obviously, as a cost issue, but also for, from a health um, and moral standpoint. We want our children to grow up healthy um, and secure and, and more physically fit. Um, related to that and the fitness issues, certainly the schools are an excellent place for us to engage. Um, 
Um, we've seen a wonderful reception from the education community on this issue. Uh, and we know through recess and form physical activity and our U.S. Healthier Schools Challenge that those are wonderful ways to do it. The, also, the reconstitution of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Nutrition as we reconstituted it this year. You know, there are probably some of you here who won the Fez President's Physical Fitness test when you were in school. I know I still have my little badges. Um, so that's a way to encourage kids. But we also know that we have to do this with parents and in communities. So looking for ways for kids to have outlets, not only through sports leagues, but through non-competitive play um, and encouraging that. Sean was talking earlier about the built environment so that kids can bike to school and they can walk to school. So there are a whole number of ways that we're doing this. The critical thing is that we are thinking across the landscape. What we can do, state and local government, private sector, and as I said, most importantly, empowering parents so that parents are saying to their kids and recognizing, yeah, I've heard 60 minutes of play a day is important. Get up and go outside and, and play and feel safe and secure that their children can do that and not have to worry about them. So that, those are some of the examples. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to add anything to that, but those are some of the examples in the way that we are approaching this. And with that, I'm going to have to conclude. Thank you so much for your questions and your interest, and we look forward to talking to you further in the future about this initiative. Thank you.